compliments for John O'Hurley. I'm, uh, I'm going to do the Phil Donahue thing, sir. So if anybody has questions, I'll be wandering around making sure they get, they get heard. That's lovely. Nice to be with you all today. Thank you for coming. Let's, uh, let's make sure that the bottom is up. Most interesting look of looking group I think I've ever spoken to. <laughs> I think your volume is up. Yeah. Mine's good. Okay. All right. Very good, sir. Well, nice to be with you all. Nice to meet you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. I appreciate you. Um, so tell us, let's start thing off. Tell us a little bit about how you got started in the business in the first place. What, what drew you to stage and screen? Well, at the age of three, I had a large, a lot of people that would be asking me the same question. What do you want to be when you grow up? And I remember responding to them by putting my hands on my hips, pointing to the black and white television that was over there in the corner of the living room, and with a sense of disgust that only a three-year-old can muster, I would say, well, I am an actor, so that's what I'm going to be. At the age of three, I knew that I not was going to be an actor, but that I was an actor. And every time I watched television, I always knew that I was supposed to be there. And so for me, growing up was just a sense of connecting the dots between then and now, and, uh, and I always knew I defined myself as an actor, and um, so far I've been, I've been doing okay. Young Master Tiger, what do you got for him? Other than uh, Kramer, I think you were the only watchable part of Seinfeld. <laughs> like, I watched it religiously at 7 o'clock every night. It was syndicated up here. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And I, I love watching you like, destroy a lane. Uh, well, you know, thank you. That's very nice of you. I had nobody had more fun on Seinfeld than I did. Um, and I, I will give you a little um, side note. Not a lot of people know this, but the year after Seinfeld ended, I actually bought the J. Peterman Company. So the real John Peterman and I actually owned the J. Peterman Company. That's uh, fantastic. Ever, ever since 19, ever since the year 2000, shortly, shortly after the show, I uh, I basically liked the role so much I bought the company. <laughs> I, I was going to ask about that. I'm sure you've probably answered this question a thousand times before, but when you were cast in that particular role, uh, were you? Did you already know Mr. Peterman? Had you met him before? I had never heard of the company before. I had never heard of anything associated with that before. In fact, I had never watched Seinfeld okay. before I was on Seinfeld. And I'll tell you that what happened, uh, the way that it all came about. Uh, I had a show, a, a sitcom on uh, ABC called A Whole New Ball Game. And you'd have to go back into like 1994 and remember a series called Coach. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. it was it was a series that was supposed to parallel Coach mm -hmm. and uh, and follow same producers. Anyway, the season the series only lasted three quarters of the season on ABC. So they called one morning as I was on my way to the studio and said, "Don't bother coming to work. They're pulling the plug on the show." Oh. That's the way they tell you. Um, so I went out to dinner that night with my manager, crying in my beer, trying to take the cancellation as personally as I possibly could, <laughs> and. Uh, Larry David's office had called and, uh, and said we heard the John's uh, series got canceled. Uh, we have this guest star this week and we think it's a role that he could have a lot of fun with. Uh, is he interested? And so I told my manager, I said, tell him no. I said, I I'm still licking my wounds off yeah. the, after uh, the, uh, can the, the cancellation of the series. So. I went to bed that night and having said no to, uh, to Seinfeld and I woke up the next morning, my manager called and said, all right, I didn't call them. So just get out of bed, go over there and have some fun. I said, no. And, and truth be known, I allow myself 24 hours to mourn anything. That's my limit. After that, I become kind of right. self-centered and I don't, I'm not happy. So. Um, so anyway, I got, to, I got up, went over to Seinfeld, and they were the most disorganized show on television. They hadn't even finished the script for that week. All they had was a few pages of dialogue and the J. Peterman catalog, which if you've not seen it, is the most unusual catalog in the world. It is um, romantic wear, uh, one-of-a-kind type of clothing. Uh, it's, uh, it has a long Hemingway story. Uh, attached to an Oxford button-down with a price, a size, and, and availability. Uh, it's the strangest thing I had ever seen. And so they handed me the catalog and they said, we just want him to sound as though 
this catalog copy is just tripping off his lips. And I said, well, that's interesting. So as I was reading, uh, uh, pursing my way through the catalog, it occurred to me that it sounded a little bit like a 1940s radio drama combined with a little bit yes. of a bad Charles Perrault. And so that became really the origin of the genesis of the character. And as time went on, and, and in the first episode, I was really kind of, you know, a little bit weird, but, uh, but, no, but fairly normal. Um, in the hands of the writers, I got crazier and crazier and crazier, <laughs> to the point when I went off to Burma to find myself, if you can imagine anything more insufferable than Peterman finding himself. And, uh, and I remember one time there was a little boy in the corner of the, uh, of the room there, and I looked at him once Elaine came into the, uh, she found me there in Burma, um, and I looked at the little boy who was standing at the entrance and I said, Bugala, Bugala Manjaka. And she said, Mr. Peterman, you speak Burmese? I said, oh, for heaven's sakes, no, Elaine, that was gibberish. <laughs> so, I mean, it was, it was, that's a perfect definition of the character. He was an absolute raving lunatic. He yeah. was kind of a, a, a corporate Mr. Magoo. But, it was uh, one of the great experiences that I had in all of television because it gave the writers an opportunity to write. Um, rather than writing single line jokes and things like that, they wrote in long form for J. Peterman. They wrote it, they gave him these monologues that would go on and on and on. And unfortunately for the Seinfeld audience, you never got to see, you never really got to see the whole monologue because the, the shows were always 10 minutes too long. You know, they would have to cut them back to 22 minutes so they could stick in all the commercials. And the shows were always too long. They were always about 30 minutes so they had to clip it out. So the best thing to do was to clip out, the first thing we do is clip the Peterman monologue. So the thing that I'd spent all week, you know, memorizing, putting into shape and getting it finally honed, well, I knew it was going to end up on the cutting room floor. So we got to demand the director's cut. That's exactly right. Well, I'll say, look, I, I will give you one of the monologues that was one of my awesome. favorites. And this was uh, in the Friars Club episode when um, Elaine was, uh, I thought, had, I, I mistakenly thought that she was having an office romance with a guy named Bob. And so I decided that I was going to play Cupid and encourage this relationship. And so I walked into her office late one afternoon and I slap down two tickets to the Karamazov Brothers Circus and I tell her that she and Bob can knock off a little early to get ready. Well, she looks at me as though I was growing a second head and she said, Bob! And this was the monologue they cut. I said, Elaine, don't worry. I too am no stranger to love on the clock. As a young lad, my father apprenticed me to a honey factory in Belize. The chief beekeeper was this horrible hag of a woman with gnarled teeth and a giant walk that she called a nose. Ooh, she was not attractive, even by backward standards. But love is truly blind, Elaine, and as the days went on, working closer and closer together, that sweet smell of honey in the air, I knew I had to have that horrible creature. And I did. So, you and Bob have a good time tonight. <laughs> On the cutting room floor. <laughs> and as a side note, I, um, many of you have heard of this new uh, uh, online computer platform called Cameo.com. And basically what they are, they give uh, kind of an extension of what you have here, but they give uh, actors a chance to uh, give shout outs to people, fans. Uh, for their birthdays, for retirements, for meaningful messages, for just, you know, shout outs if somebody's not feeling well or whatever. Uh, and so what I have done is I have written a half a dozen uh, Peterman monologues now that I tailor to individual people. And I have more fun doing this now. Every day I do 10 or 12 of these uh, monologues on cameo.com. So if you ever in a, if you ever need a birthday present or a, anything like that, just go to cameo.com, put up Peterman there, and, uh, and then we'll do one for you. They're an awful lot of fun. I have a great deal. So for me, the character is still lives. That's great. That's fantastic. Uh, and the fact that you, you, you purchased, you were in the company, uh, part owner of the company. I actually, but, yeah, but what happened was um, the real John Peterman and the J. Peterman company flourished under the five years that I was on Seinfeld. They went from 
uh, I think uh, they went from about $15 million a year in sales up to over $100 million in sales. Fantastic. Uh, thanks to about $750 million worth of publicity. That's what NBC told me that they got during my run there. So they, consequently, they did very well. Well, as high as they went is as high as they fell. Uh, shortly after Seinfeld ended, um, the Peterman Company went into some, had some serious financial difficulties and they went into Chapter 11. Well, as it turns out, about a year after that, uh, John Peterman called me and says, I think I can put the company back together again, if you're interested. Uh, so I wrote him a large check. And, uh, and then he and I uh, owned the company together. I was on the board with him, and we would uh, have our board meetings, and the company ran as it always did, and it ran back up again, did very well. And I would, we would always have our board meetings in New York City. And this was the funniest thing, because after the board meeting, John Peterman, the real Jay Peterman, and I would walk down the street on Madison Avenue to go have lunch together. And every cop car that would go by, and you know, Manhattan being the home of Seinfeld, would pull over or roll their windows down and go, Hey, Peterman! And they weren't talking to him. Yeah. <laughs> and that, I thought, was the strangest thing about this entire five-year run, or now seven, because this was several years after it ended, is that this was the greatest act of identity theft ever. <laughs> this poor man, all he did was run a successful clothing company, and then one morning, or one, he finds himself being parodied on the number one show on television. He never gave them permission to do that. But Seinfeld was the kind of show where they said it's easier to apologize afterwards than it is to get permission up front. And so that's exactly what they did. They just went ahead and did the parody, and all of a sudden he finds himself stripped of his identity. Yeah. Because for the rest of his life, I'm going to be Jay Peterman. And people, any time he goes to a restaurant and, you know, signs this thing, Jay Peterman, they go, oh, stop it, you are not. <laughs> you know, several actors, have, have, they portrayed real life people over the years. And, and you know, some are past, some are still with us. Was that first me actual meeting with John Peterman, was it awkward in any way, shape, or form? It was actually done uh, on a show on Fox Television, which was a morning show that Tom Bergeron actually hosted. Okay. And it was called Fox After Breakfast. And um, the Peterman character was just starting to take off. It uh, was just starting to take off on Seinfeld. And so they thought it would be funny to bring the real Jay Peterman and I together uh, for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea what he looked like, who he was, or anything. And uh, so sure enough, they, uh, they, they put us together and it was like, you know, I mean, he looks like um, a kind of a Kentucky rancher version of Mr. Whipple, um, <laughs> you know, with the thick Coke bottle glasses there the, and uh, balding. And uh, so anyway, so, you know, I walk out on stage and I, you know, I finally meet him and I go, it's like looking in a mirror. You know? <laughs> um, so it was, uh, but he and I became very good friends after that and I, he would, uh, I would send him wine and he would send me clothing. So it was a kind of a nice barter. But we get, uh, and to this day, we still have uh, kept a very nice, cordial relationship. That's great. That's a, that's a fantastic story. I did not know the portion where you had become part of the company. So that's, that's an amazing thing. Does anybody else have questions for Mr. O'Hurley? Yes. I'm going to start right here and I'm going to work my way back. I see all of your hands. I'll go ahead. Um, when you did the, uh, when you were the guest star for the, uh, the Drake and Josh episode, like, uh, the approach for that, like, how did, like, how did that come about when you were being, like, tasked for that, or, and the approach with the whole... I, I'm trying to remember, I was playing a doctor, was that you the one where I was playing a doctor? Yeah, you were like, you were like, you're Dr. Nussbaum. Oh, yes, that's right, yeah, I was a, uh, a doctor on soap operas, I wasn't, I was, I was a... Yeah. I wasn't a real doctor, was I? No, you were the real doctor. Drake was impersonating me. Oh, that's why he was impersonating me, yes, yes. He was yeah. impersonating doctor. You know, I, I barely remember that. <laughs> I hate, I hate to, to, to burst the bubble on it. I, I might have been on a 13-day Chianti binge, I don't know. But, <laughs> um, but I, I, I do remember doing it, but I also did another episode, I think, on Drake and John. I think I did... Um, I know you did that Unto one. Unsolved Mysteries. I think I did that. It was uh, it was that episode. I think it was I did one about a year later as another character. That's why I'm kind of confusing. But I honestly don't remember all that well. Um, I, I've done. I think I guest starred on over a hundred shows, uh, <laughs> and not one is still on the air. By the way, I have a habit of killing. 
I'm gonna come over here, and then I see some hands over there, so I'll be over there in a moment. Uh, what was it like being on Family Feud? Because you were one of my favorite hosts. Oh, thank, thank you. you, thank you. Well, I had, you know, I had a wonderful time. I, it, it was, believe it or not, not the first game show that I hosted. I years before then, back in very shortly after Seinfeld, I hosted a show called um, To Tell the Truth, which has the game honored phrase or time honored phrase. Will the real so and so please stand up? Uh, and it was a wonderful show. I, and that was truly, I think if I had to look back on anything, uh, uh, that was my favorite show. But then Family Feud came along and I had a wonderful time doing it. And what I loved about Family Feud was that it trained your instincts to be funny. Uh, because I had no writers, I had nothing else other than my, the, head of me, the head of my shoulders. And I literally had to walk out on stage every time and say, I'm going to leap and let the net, and let the net appear. And that's what I did. And uh, I just had to trust that what I had in my head was enough uh, to be funny and to move the game along at the same time and to treat it like a cocktail party, uh, which is kind of what I did. And I had the best time doing it. Now, coincidentally, I still be I, I did leave the show at one point because I was starting to feel the show was becoming kind of a, a kind of a dirty, kind of a quiet, dirty joke. And, and it was a family show, and I was getting some awful fan stuff and I'm going, I, I don't want to do this anymore. It's just not, it's becoming too much of a, uh, kind of a penis joke. And I said, I don't want to do it, it's not my style. And they were also moving the show down to, um, down to uh, Universal Studios down there in, in Orlando. And I said, well, that's where game shows go to die. You know, so I, uh, we parted ways and uh, quite happily. And uh, uh, Steve Harvey's got it now, he's doing a great job with it. So in somebody else's hands, but I had a great time. I, I really had a great time doing it. It was a lot of fun. I will tell you, uh, it, it gave me a chance to be around people who are otherwise intelligent human beings who when you turn a camera on, all of a sudden they become absolutely dumb as a box of rocks. Um, I had two guys that looked both like college graduates come up to the, uh, the face-off there and and I started off by saying, all right, um, we surveyed 100 people, top six answers are on the board. Name a classic film that begins with the letter C. C, and you would say, Casablanca, Citizen Kane, Caddy, Caddyshack, <laughs> Caddy, Caddyshack is one of them, all of them up there. And the guy looks at me and goes, ah, Sea Biscuit. <laughs> oh my God, we can't make that up, Sea Biscuit. Yeah, but fun time. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much, though, for some good question. Words. Yes, sir. Uh, what advice would you give for an upcoming actor if they wanted to find work? Jesus, if you can find it, let me know. Sorry, that was good. You know, the, the business is so much different than when, I mean, it sounds like a cliche to say, but it, it truly is. I don't recognize the business that I'm in anymore. And that's because it's become so fragmented and so marginalized into these tiny little mini things um, that no longer represent the structure that we used to have. We had three networks, we had movies that you did, um, and, then, uh, and then in some cases they would go to this thing called home box office, which was not a box office at all, it had been prepaid. Um, and so that was like the new innovation when I was starting off in the business. Um, and there was, this, you know, Broadway had its Broadway shows, and there was dinner theaters, and there were touring companies. And we're established vehicles for an actor, definitive things. Today, not so much. Today, you can take your camera, and you can shoot a movie. And you can cast everybody in this room if you wanted to, and by the time you finished in an hour and a half, you'd have your own movie. And, and you can download that now, and you send it over to a place called YouTube, and people will watch it. And if enough people watch it, you can then sell sponsorships to it, and, or people will pay for the ad time. It's, it's a whole other world for actors right now. So my, my answer to them when they say, how do we get work, it's, it's, my answer is, how do you create work for yourself? Because if you want to wait for somebody to give you a call, there's a long line of people ahead of you. Um, so it's, it, you really have to be your own advocate. And how do I create work for myself? I'll tell you what I do, and I'll give you an example of this. Uh, I do a great deal of spokesman 
software spokesman for, for major companies and what have you. Uh, I don't wait for my agent at William Morris to call me and say, well, we have you're now going to be the spokesman for Coors. I go to Coors and I say, I have a really good idea for you. And that's how I end up doing most of my work. And I have to tell you that over the years, I've had a much more successful vehicle by choosing that than I have waiting for the phone to ring. So I would encourage you, a quick, a quick answer to your question is create work for yourself and you'll always be employed. Do, do you find it that, you're, now that you're advocating for yourself, that, that was there any pushback at that originally? Like a lot of the, the old school people who talked to me in the past, I said, if I didn't go for my agent, I was in trouble. But do you feel that advocating yourself seems to be a lot more easier these days? I also don't include my agent in it. See, that? there you go. There's no 10% for him because he didn't bring that deal to me. Skip the middleman. That's exactly right. I cut him right out and I said, if I'm going to be, if I am creating the campaign and I'm creating the actor, what do I need you for? Right. Right. Very good. Okay. Um, what was it like playing King Neptune on SpongeBob? Well, that was kind of fun. I, you know, I, I, I have loved the animated career, and I'll tell you why I like it so much. I have a, um, I have a young son, and uh, he's now 14, uh, so I wouldn't call him that young anymore. He's moving into his, his teenage years, or as I like to refer it, as Mark Twain once said, he knows a multitude of things that are mostly wrong. <laughs> but that being said, I have enjoyed thoroughly the past... 14 years of doing uh, animated shows, these characters like King Neptune, um, because it gives him, or gives me a body of work that he can watch. Um, you know, there's, if I'm doing other TV nighttime TV series, it's just not interesting to them, but because I have 15, 20 cartoons that I do, um, all the way down, I mean, I'm Mr. Slade on the Flintstones, I'm Walter Bunny on Bugs Bunny, I, uh, Skipper Shelton on um, Scooby-Doo. I mean, a lot of other things besides uh, the more prominent ones like uh, Phineas and Ferb and, uh, and uh, King Neptune on, on SpongeBob. But, you know, the, the, what I love about animation is that it's really on your schedule. They're not sticking to a real clock. So I can be anywhere in the world and still do my work. I, I was over in England one time and recording a show um, over the airwave, I mean over the you know digital media there in the studio, but recording in LA and that, you know some 15, 14 hours apart. So I mean it, it's, a, it's a wonderful world. It's a wonderful world because you can show up and work in your pajamas. But it's one, and it's also large and big and expansive and it, you know King Neptune with the. SpongeBob, that was quite a burger. <laughs> All right, where's some hands? All right, got this gentleman, and now I'll come back and visit you. All right, so I already had the opportunity to ask you when I was getting your autograph uh, if Larry David had reached out about working on character enthusiasm at all. So I also wanted to ask you now: uh, Have you had the opportunity to? Good afternoon. Uh, Attention with. everybody, if you are coming for the cosplay contest for free judging, please show up 10 minutes early. Thank you. If you had the opportunity to either work with or just keep in touch with or see Julia at all. Uh, we, we keep in touch. We have not worked together uh, since, uh, but we're, you know, I do a lot of charity work and she does as well, so we end up showing, it a lot, showing up at a lot of these fundraisers and uh, charity dinners and things like that. And, you know, we'll always stay, you know, wonderful friends. We're all, I mean, we're all family. It's all family, you know. You, uh, you know, all the guys that I work with, like Patrick Warburton and Brian Prince, I mean, these are all part of my family. I mean, these are all best friends of mine. So, you know, they, you, you stay close because the, the business is actually very small. It's not a big business at all. I got to meet Patrick. He's fun. Yes. He's a great, great guy. Dear, dear friend. Where'd you meet Patrick? Okay, I'm back here. Uh, in addition to all of your TV roles, I know you also do some live stuff, Broadway, that kind of thing. Any good stories about some of your live shows? Um, I, I have um, a, a long uh, Broadway career uh, that started actually back in 1981. Because when I went to New York, I really was there to... Um, I was there to be a working actor. I mean, the idea of being in television or film or anything was so far beyond me because I really didn't have... 
a, an example of that in my life. It was a very foreign medium for me. So I truly went to New York to be a stage actor, and I would have been very happy if I had just gone from repertory theater to repertory theater around the country. Um, and uh, so, but I will tell you a, a and, and this is one of the first times I've told this story. How, how old is everybody in the room here? Okay, this is this is a good one. Um, Raise yourselves. I, rem I, I I always prided myself on making my living as an actor, and I never had to do anything else. I was never a waiter or anything like that. I always, but it didn't mean that there were some very difficult times. And I remember one time I went over to the uh, Federal Credit Union at Actors Equity and I tried to uh, take money out of the bank, and they said, no, you're below the limit, you'll close the account. So I had less than $10 to my name. Plus, I had change in my pocket and one subway token. And I said to myself, oh my God, I have never been in this situation. I've never borrowed any money, I've never asked parents for money or anything. And I had to give myself, so I walked over to Central Park, over by the plaza, and I found, and I sat down there by the pond there, and I found a copy of the Village Voice that had been all rolled up. And, I, and back, and this was back in the early 80s, and it was a time when uh, all of the part, all the part-time jobs that were in the classifieds in the back of the Village Voice. That was the, because that was the weekly publication that came out. So I was looking through and I said, I've got to find a part-time job. This, I've just got to do it. I've got to bite the bullet and i just got to find something. But I don't know what I can do. Well, I came from West Hartford, Connecticut. And I'm a little not, I grew up very, very naive. So that as I'm flipping through the part-time jobs, I'm like, okay, okay. Oh, here's one. It says male escort. I had no idea what a male escort was. I just knew that from the classified ads, I could earn up to $1,200 a week as a, as a male escort. And I'm going, well, this is a pretty good thing. <laughs> I said, and some of them are even $2,000, they're saying. So I said, well, maybe I should run down an interview with these places. So I walked back to 98th Street, where I was living in Manhattan. And I said, well, I'll put my jacket and uh, you know dress up, and, you know, and I'll use the one subway token I have to get down there and try try to have my interview that day as a male escort. I get home, and before I went into the room and showered up, and I went back and I checked my answering machine. We had answering machines back then. And the light was blinking, which meant I had a message. And so I played the, played the tape back, and I found out I had gotten the lead to Pirates of Penzance on Broadway. And that kept me from being able to sit here and say I was a male escort. <laughs> True story. How Pirates of Penzance go? Great. Any other questions? Oh, so the best. That was my favorite show up until Chicago and, uh, and Spamalot. Oh, yes, sir. Um, what was it like working on the Disney shows, like Wizards of Waverly Place and Casey Undercover? Well, I always had a great time with them because the characters are always so large and big, and they um, and they only called me for those big kind of demonstrative type of characters. I played, uh, I think I, I played the president one time, which was kind of fun, um, and uh, and I played, um, oh gosh, he was some he was, he was some superhero that came to life, I guess. Um, he was a, a space, or a kind of a, 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 an astronaut or something, I think, like, he was, I mean, that kind of stuff was just so much fun, and it was just so, uh, but again, I, I did that stuff because I wanted to have a body of work that my son would watch, and uh, so that's what I did, you know, it was like, I, I, I'm not into trying to create a, you know, strategic body of work that I can, you know, only look like a movie star or something, I'm here to work and have fun doing it. John, can you tell us a little bit what it was like to be on Dancing with the Stars? Uh-huh. Well, Dancing with the Stars uh, was God's great practical joke. Uh, I'm the guy who would go to the wedding reception, and when the dancing and the music would start, I would walk my way with my glass of Chardonnay and go stand and hold up a wall and say, knock yourselves out, Shriners. I was not a dancer, and I never pretended to be. 
So I got a call one day from ABC, and they said, we want to take you to lunch and pitch you a show. And I should have been suspicious right away, because ABC never takes me to lunch, and they don't pitch me shows. But I went there, and there I met them in Beverly Hills at this restaurant, and they it was a little group of 20-year-olds with their jackets and their laptops, and they flipped them all open, and they wanted me to see a show from England called Strictly Come Dancing. And Strictly Come Dancing was a show that had beautiful, beautiful people, great music, live performances, and I just said, this is absolutely incredible. And the choreography was not to be believed. I said, this is wonderful. And they said, yes, it's a show on competitive ballroom dancing. And I said, yeah. And they said, and I said, I'd be happy to host it. And they said, no, we want you to do it. And I said, no, I'll host it. And they said, no, you'll do it. And I'm going to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. I always live by my imagination, not my rational mind. My rational mind will always lie to me. My imagination doesn't lie. It can't lie to me because all it knows is what I'm capable of. And I saw the picture in my head of being a success on this show. And I said, I don't know how to ballroom dance and I'm almost 50 years old, so shame on me. So I said, all right, I'll do it. Who else have you got? They said, you're the first person we've asked. But now that we have you, we know we can get Evander Holyfield. I said, what? <laughs> then it hit me. That what ABC was doing was trying to use this summer replacement series as a way to give America what they had been hoping for for more than 20 years. And that was the Vander Holyfield John O'Hurley matchup on the level playing field of ballroom dancing. <laughs> and for those of you who did watch it, if you remember correctly, I took him out in the third round with my Foxtrot. <laughs> but it was a great experience. I had the greatest time doing it. I dropped some 20 pounds that I never gained back, and it was uh, I, I just it was it was great television, and it, it supported what I love about television is reality television. It, is that people are trying to be better than they were. I hate these shows that, in, in reality television, where they, they become the story, rather than learning the infinitely more difficult task of trying to tell a story. You know, you have the Kardashians that are willing to trash their life just to become a television show. I have no use for that. Dancing with the Stars are people who don't know how to dance, that are trying to, and are willing to put it out there in front of national television. But it's the toughest thing I've ever done, I'll tell you. It's a little bit like somebody dropping a violin in your lap and saying, could you possibly have a concerto for the entire country to listen to next Tuesday night? Well, it, was, it was fun to watch for us. I, I, my mom is a big fan. You know, and, and we had everybody on the street was all banding together to watch this week after week because it was something different. It was, we, were, we were pointing it out. People were used to it reality. Was, it, was, it was past this first season. It uh, was astronomical. They had over 30 million people yeah. watching. I mean, those were Seinfeld numbers. Uh, you know, television just doesn't get those numbers anymore. Dancing doesn't get it. But that first season, which it was just something new mm -hmm. that they had never seen before. And... Uh, and so, I mean, I, I remember uh, I was driving in my car on my way to the studio to rehearse with my uh, dance partner. And I don't know if you remember Paul Harvey. Yeah, I did. Uh, the great broadcaster. And I had always had such respect for him. He was one of my young idols. And, and as I learned to be a public speaker, he was one of the people that I, that I really kind of uh, meant, used as a mentor. And... I'm driving down uh, Sunset Boulevard in, in Los Angeles, and uh, the noon the new news comes on at 5 to 12, he was on every day. And I remember him saying, and now this crazy, crazy uh, show that has taken the uh, country by storm, Dancing with the Stars, wondering, will John O'Hurley win? And I went, oh my God. The, I had the, the fact that I had Paul Harvey announcing my name mm -hmm. on television. I just I, I nearly drove the the car off the road. That's, that's yeah, it was just. I mean, but that was the spasm of, of excitement over the show, and it was really wonderful. What a great experience. 
I got time for one more question. Who's willing? This young lady right here. We're gonna sit right next to you. All right. So, can you tell us a little bit about hosting the National Dog Show? Are there any like, uh, stories? Yes. Well. Uh, yes, this Thanksgiving, um, I, I do a lot of different things. Uh, I've had a crazy career because I've always been lucky enough to put my finger through the belt loops of some really great franchises. Seinfeld was one of them, and certainly um, I got a call from NBC Sports back in 2002, um, and I picked up the phone and I said hello, and on the other end was the head of NBC Sports, and John Miller, and he said, um, I said hello, and he said, Wolf, Wolf. And that's how it all started. Uh, with the, he had taken Best in Show home uh, that night, or over the weekend, and he had watched it. It was that, the parody, Best in Show, a wonderful, very funny movie. He came back Monday morning and said, I'm, we're going to do a dog show. And they about laughed him out of the office. Because they had that two-hour space between the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade and football that they never had anything that they could fulfill with any sort of certainty or any great ratings. And, they would show It's a Wonderful Life or something like that. They would lose their entire audience from the Macy's Parade. So um, he called me and he said, uh, I want you to do a dog show. I said, okay. And once again, I listened to my imagination. I said, okay, for some reason I'm supposed to do this. So I said, okay. That was 20 years ago. And it is now our 20th anniversary of this Thanksgiving, and it's, uh, you know, the fact that I have not killed the show by now is, I think, a, a real testament to how powerful dogs are. Um, but I started off uh, with, uh, I, I will finish with a joke here, uh, and it's, uh, it, it's an actually a true story. Um, I didn't know much about dog shows. I'd never been to one, never seen one when I started hosting them. But fortunately, I had the most knowledgeable man in the world of dogs, David Fry, at my side, and so I had to live in his shadow for quite a while. The first year, they brought up the old English sheepdog to the judge, and if you don't know what an old English sheepdog is, it's 80 pounds of hair and two pounds of actual dog. <laughs> and the judge, this elegantly gowned woman, walks around to the back of the dog and starts picking through all of the hair putting her hands all over the back of the dog. And I said to David, I said, David, can you explain what she's doing? He says, Johnny, she's putting her hands on the dog. <laughs> to make sure that the shoulders and the hips align with the written specification of what the perfect old English sheep dog should be. He said, because you can hide a really bad dog with a really good haircut. And I said, you're telling me, I went to junior prom. <laughs> So she walks around with the front of the dog and she starts picking through all of the hair on the dog's head. I said, David, can you tell us what she's doing now? He says, John, she's trying to find the eyes to gauge the attentiveness of the animal. I said, really? I said, well, if she picks through all of the hair and she finds only one eye, she's got the wrong end of the dog. <laughs> Things I have no business doing. Well, I'll thank you very much. I think that was the last question. <laughs> but thank you all. It was a lot of fun. Have some great time with you today. If you haven't stopped by our booth, and, uh, please do come by and say hi. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Hurley. Appreciate that. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.